Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to All Saints Together Online. Uh, we're looking forward to the 12th of July when we'll be able to continue All Saints Together Online, but also in person here at church. And so we're looking forward to that day. Do get in touch and let us know that you'll be joining us on that day. Um, we begin a new series today looking at uh, some people from history that we want to imitate their faith as they followed the Lord Jesus. This is what Hebrews chapter 6 says. It says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And Hebrews chapter 12, talking about in response to those who trusted God and his promises, there says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We want to run with perseverance. We want to not grow weary and lose heart. And so we look to Jesus and we look back at those who have trusted him and live for him to encourage us to keep running with perseverance. That's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. Let me pray for us as we begin this morning. Our Father, we thank you so much that you have gathered us wherever we are this morning, around your word, in the power of your spirit, and in the name of your Son. Please help us today to fix our eyes on Jesus, that we might run with perseverance the race marked out for us. May we be encouraged and strengthened as we consider the life and ministry of Billy Graham, as we think about his commitment to the Bible and his commitment to the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Please strengthen us, we pray today, that we might not grow weary and lose heart, and we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's encourage one another and strengthen our faith as we sing of God and his character. So we 
might work for that glorious day when sin and death pass away. Now is the moment, the day of salvation. This is the hour to be serving the King, bearing the gospel, go to the nations. Now is the time for our tribute to bring and live for the Jocelyn here with today's Kids Talk. Uh, now the talk is going to be about a really sad story today. It's going to be about the day that Jesus died. The reason we're going to talk about this is because we're going to see who Jesus is 
and how that was revealed even more so than it had been before on the day that he died. Uh, we're going to look at some of the people who recognised Jesus for who he truly was. Now, the accusations that Jesus was under was that he was claiming to be king of the Jews. And the reason that they didn't like that, uh, the religious leaders didn't like that because that was going to take away their power. And the Romans didn't like that because they thought he might lead a rebellion against them. And so the religious leaders managed to convince the Romans to kill Jesus. Now, because that was the charge against him, lots of people mocked Jesus. They teased him and they made him wear a crown of thorns and a, and a purple robe like a king would wear. And as he walked along, they spat on him and they jeered at him and they said, Hail the King of the Jews. But actually, we know that that's who Jesus truly was. So when they brought him to the cross on Golgotha, they put a sign up above his cross that said, the King of the Jews. And that was just another way that they were mocking him and teasing him. But, you know, there were other people there that day, people who really did recognise Jesus for who he truly was. Jesus didn't die alone. There were two other people who were sentenced to die that day. And they were on crosses next to Jesus. These were two men who were guilty of the crimes that they were accused of. And one of them, he was mocking Jesus as well. He said, if you really are the king of the Jews, then why don't you come down on this off this cross and you bring down us with you? But the other man, the other criminal said, stop teasing him. Can't you see who he is? And he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, your kingdom. He's recognising that Jesus really is the king. He's God's king, the king of heaven. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Because this man had faith in who Jesus is. Now, they weren't the only people that were there that day. There were lots of people standing around watching the crucifixion. Some of them were there to mock and tease. Some of them were there because they were friends, people who loved Jesus. But the other group of people who were there were the centurions. They were the Roman guards whose job it was to kill people. This is what they did every day. Obviously, that is his spear. Um, here is a centurion. Now, when Jesus died, some amazing things happened. Everything went black. The whole land was dark. And the temple curtain, a big, thick curtain in the temple, was torn in two right down the middle from top to bottom. And Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Now, when this centurion, this Roman guard, saw all of those things, he said, surely this is the Son of God. He recognised, that's another name for the Messiah. Even though he wasn't a Jew, he wasn't someone who was waiting for the Messiah to come, he recognised who Jesus was because of the amazing things that happened on the day that Jesus died. So here, even as Jesus is dying, we still see who he is. And we see it even clearer than we've seen it some other times. So even though this is a sad day for lots of reasons, it's also a happy day for lots of reasons. We were saved from our sins because of Jesus' death. But also we get to see that Jesus really is the Messiah. People recognised who he was. Uh, I'm going to put up a few questions now for you guys to talk about with your families as we think about Jesus as the Messiah and how that was shown on the day that he died. Hi, I'm Justine, and I'm looking forward to being back with you at church in a little while. 
I'm going to be praying for us today and I'm going to be praying about COVID, the particular stresses that we've experienced in this time, as well as the prospect of resuming church life and also racial reconciliation. Would you please join with me? Our Father, we thank you for your mercy and kindness to us expressed in countless ways. We praise you knowing that every good thing comes from your hands and that even in the midst of any suffering or trial, you can bring unexpected good. We thank you that Australia has weathered the pandemic better than we might have otherwise, and we ask that you restrain its effects as it makes its way through some of the most vulnerable parts of the world, Latin America, India and Africa. We pray for good leadership, for strong communities working together, for help to reach the poor and marginalised, for robust health systems and for the development of a vaccine to fight against the virus. When we think of our church, we thank you for the ways that the leaders you have placed among us have guided us through these times. Thank you for Ben and Jocelyn particularly, but we are also aware of the many ways that our student ministers, kids leaders, music teams and Bible study leaders have swung into action at this time as well. As we emerge from shutdown, we ask that you help us to be kind and patient with each other as we adjust to different routines. And we ask that this season would open up new opportunities for us to love and serve each other and invite others to share in our life together as well. We think of anyone we know who's experienced hardship in this time, whether due to sickness, job loss, poverty, family violence, death and bereavement, broken relationships, a concern for the future, loneliness, anxiety and depression, as well as juggling overwhelming responsibilities from home, work and family life. We cry out to you for an end to the burdens that people carry. We pray for help to get to people who need it, and we pray that we would give generously to the church and also charities working to relieve people's distress. We ask that you bless and deepen our efforts to work towards a community and society that helps all people to grow and thrive. We also ask that you would be at work in people's lives, even in their darkest moments, and that you would open up a path for them to be in a life-giving relationship with you. As we consider the deep injustice experienced by people of colour, both here and abroad, we ask for a true and deep desire for reconciliation to be at work in us, knowing that Jesus not only reconciles us to you, but to each other. We pray that your spirit of reconciliation would shape our time and attention, as well as our commitments, our conversations and our life together. We thank you knowing that you hear us and that you love us and that you promise to be with us now and forever. Amen. Hello, All Saints. Hope you're all well. It's, uh, I feel like we're starting to thaw out. The social thaw is slowly melting and um, I'm really liking it. I'm feeling a lot better than I did a few months ago and I hope you are too and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all back in our beautiful church face to face. Be great. Um, uh, when, uh, when Jocelyn asked me to, to do this reading and, and talk a little bit about what I've been up to, I thought uh, you might be interested in some podcasts that I've been listening to. Um, particularly early in the, in the COVID break lockdown, I got very twitchy and my way of dealing with that anxiety was to walk, just get out and walk by myself, socially distanced, but walking. And I'd walk down to the river, Cook's River, and just the water and the, the trees and the peacefulness and these great Christian podcasts really made a difference for me. And, uh, and then also I've been able to share them with a few people. Carrie and I have been getting together every couple of weeks and talking about some of the podcasts that, we, that I listen to and um, I've shared some with some of the rest of you. Um, so I'm hoping that as, as this goes out, you might you know, get some ideas of podcasts to listen to. Apparently, um, well, I find it's a great way to exercise and you know, be challenged in my thinking. But apparently... Um, 
uh, Stephen Fry is a, a big podcast and audiobook listener, and he said that he lost nine stone by going for walks with audiobooks and podcasts. I'm not quite there, but hey, you know, get fit, get interested. Anyway, I, the first one I wanted to mention was uh, called Undeceptions by John Dixon. And uh, John Dixon is an a Australian Christian uh, lecturer, uh, philosopher and minister. And in this particular one, the point of, of undecept Undeceptions is to explore an aspect of life, faith, history, culture or ethics that is either much misunderstood or mostly forgotten. And um, what I love about John Dixon is that he digs right into the history and the, the facts, you know. He digs up the, all the little bitsy pieces and puts them together in an entertaining and thought-provoking way. Um, my favorite episode recently was one called Confronting Christianity, where he interviewed a, a British uh, woman named Rebecca McLaughlin, who's recently published a book by the same name. And in that book, she discusses 12 hard questions for the world's largest religion. So it's apologetics um, book, but I found it very clear, for the most part logical, didn't agree with everything she said, but that's the whole point, is to be able to listen and to start making decisions with guidance in prayer. Um, so I recommend Undeceptions for really getting the nitty gritty of things. Um, the next one I love is called Life and Faith, which is produced by our very own Justine Toe. Maybe you don't know that she does that, but uh, she and her colleagues produce a a fantastic weekly um, podcast. They um, do this for the Center of Public Christianity. And the, uh, the range of people they talk with is amazingly varied. And the point of their exercise is to discuss the beauty and complexity of belief in the 21st century. They do a great job of it. Um, it must be a challenge to actually edit those episodes because they're so interesting. Um, their guests are really wide and varied. Um, one of my, and, and one of the fun things that they do is they cut snippets from the interview in the um, lead-in to each of the weekly podcasts. And just listening to that is quite funny. It's a really funny snippets. It makes you want to listen further. Um, so I recommend that. Um, and in particular, the episode I recently really enjoyed was um, one called The Long Shadow of Slavery, which, yes, ties in with all the um, disruption and, and distress that goes with the current racial tensions around the world. Um, but it's a black American minister who talks about his personally confronting experience about racial division in the U.S. And it, it's a very challenging talk, but it's well worth listening to. So that's Life and Faith. And my third favorite one is one called Salt, Conversations with Jenny. And um, it's hosted by Jenny Salt, who is a um, lecturer at the uh, Sydney Missionary Bible College, SMBC. And her podcast is set to take you deeper into the lives of ordinary people with heartwarming, sometimes challenging, and always distinctive gospel stories. Um, I found this podcast particularly um, heartening and reassuring. Uh, the people that she interviews are very generous and honest in sharing their ups and downs and ins and outs of faith. Um, and I found it, yeah, just calming. Like, yeah, I, I understand those, those points of view or, or I better understand how you would get to whatever point the, the person is talking about in their life. So I recommend having a look at those, and I'll give you those links later. So now I'm going to be reading um, today, this week's Bible uh, reading, and it's going to be John 3, verses 1 to 16. And um, it contains one of my most favorite Bible verses. In fact, it's the first one I ever memorized when I was at school. I was given this one to memorize. John 3, 16. It's just beautiful. So, I will get started. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus one night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the mirac miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit 
gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it is cut from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thanks be to God. Hi everyone, my name is Peter Rohr. I'm a member of the Morning Congregation uh, at All Saints. And uh, today we begin a new series uh, where we're looking at some... Uh, figures from Christian history, uh, some heroes of the faith, and uh, uh, the prayer is that as we look at these uh, people, we'll be encouraged. Hebrews 6 verse 10 tells us, uh, be imitators of those who through faith and promise, patience, inherit the promises. Uh, later in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7, uh, the writer tells us to remember your leaders, those who spoke uh, to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And so what these uh, three sermons are, are really, you can think of them as an extended application of those two verses in Hebrews. Uh, we're wanting to uh, learn from the lives of those who've gone before us and uh, be uh, encouraged in our own uh, Christian walk. So why don't I pray and then we'll look uh, uh, a little bit at the life of Billy Graham. Uh, Father, we do thank you for those who have gone before us as Christian brothers and sisters, and uh, we do pray uh, that you would help us to learn from their example and uh, that we might be encouraged and challenged uh, to live more wholeheartedly for the Lord Jesus, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Uh, so today we're considering uh, the life of Billy Graham. Uh, Billy Graham died uh, two years ago in 2018 at the age of 99, and uh, he was perhaps the most famous evangelist uh, that the world has uh, known really since uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, nearly 215 million people in more than 185 countries and territories heard the gospel through Billy Graham. Uh, I actually heard the gospel in 1989. Uh, Billy Graham was uh, visiting the United Kingdom and he had a, a a tour called Life, and uh, he was speaking in London, but uh, his talks were live streamed, if you like, uh, all over the country. And so I heard uh, him preach in a little um, church hall in the middle of rural uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, I went forward, and it was the beginning of um, some investigating uh, that led uh, to me becoming a Christian. I don't really remember much uh, from that evening except I was struck by Billy Graham's humility. Uh, there was some singing at the start of the uh, evening, and after the singing, it just switched to him as he started uh, speaking. And I remember really being struck. I was expecting this famous evangelist to have a rock star introduction, uh, but no, he just started speaking uh, the word of God. And I'm very thankful to how God used him in my own life and in uh, many other people's lives. Uh, he has had, or he had, uh, under God, a, a significant impact on Australia and Sydney in particular. Uh, he visited uh, Sydney three times uh, for three different uh, crusades in 1959, 1968, and 1979, and uh, those were significant uh, times, and uh, we're going to hear from uh, Peter and Mary O'Brien and their reflections on the 1959 uh, crusade in Sydney.
The 1959 Billy Graham Crusade was a, a really wonderful time, and you remember that, don't you? Yes, very uh, well. Very well. We uh, we were involved in uh, in the counselling classes uh, beforehand, which and the training of that was was marvellous. Yeah, for me, the counselling classes were probably the most significant part of the whole crusade. Um, I would go to the city town hall, which was absolutely packed, and we were taught how to um, understand the way of salvation. And I was only 19 at 18 at the time, and um, I had been a Christian for a few years, and we were taken through from um, Romans 3.23. We had to understand that we were sinners, and we moved through each week. We had a little packet of memory verses, and we had to remember them, and we would say them to each other, and they would um, say them to the whole group. But one of the other things that, that came out of that for me was the assurance of my own salvation. And a lot of people said that at that time, in those counselling classes, they were actually converted. So mm -hmm. that was amazing. And there were thousands of people trained in that town hall at that time. I think there were 6,000 each Tuesday night when I went. Mm -hmm. And you went to the same ones, didn't you? Yes, that's, that's true. In fact, I was a student at Moore College at the time and Broughton Knox had said he wanted all the college students to go to the training classes. Uh, he didn't insist that they become counsellors afterwards because that was not uh, his prerogative, but certainly he wanted everyone to understand uh, how to evangelise, how to talk with uh, people one-on-one -on -one and, and further afield. And so that, that was uh, a wonderful occasion. Yeah. yeah. The crusade went on for about a month and it was on, I think it might have been on, it was certainly on a Sunday afternoon and then through the week it might have been five nights and the original, um, the original uh, venue was the Sydney Showground which no longer exists and then on the last Sunday they had both the Sydney Showground and the Sydney Cricket Ground and people were allowed to to go to the cricket ground onto the pitch. But as counsellors, we were told we had to sit in a certain seat and if someone near us went forward, we actually went forward with them. Um, not, like, not, um, not, what do you call it, um, spying on them, really, but to actually encourage them to, to be with them. So then you'd go down to the front and then you'd talk up to Billy Graham, talk to them and they'd sung there was a song that they sing, sung, just as I am without one plea, the Lamb of God I come. And they used to sing this, and that was very, very moving. Mm. But then we would talk to the person, and then we'd take them to an advisor, so that an um, older person often, mm. who would then, we would introduce them and they'd follow them up. Mm. Mm. The effect on many churches was amazing. I was the, the student minister at the time at, uh, at uh, St John's Darlinghurst, part of King's Cross, you might say. And uh, there were at least 300 different people who had, uh, had made some commitment uh, through the crusade. And those of us who were on the staff at, uh, at Darlinghurst were then to follow them up. There were folk from all over the King's Cross area and some who had never darkened the door of a church before, but were certainly interested and had obviously been touched by this. Mm. It was a, a wonderful occasion. Mm. Mm. There were folk like Peter Jensen and his brother Philip who were converted at uh, the 1959 crusade and, uh, and others as well. A few years later, when Billy Graham came again, there was in 68, there wasn't quite the, the same number. And there were criticisms made uh, about the Crusades, etc., et by those who didn't agree with them. And um, Broughton Knox, the principal of Moore College, wrote to Billy Graham and pointed out that the numbers of folk who had been converted at the 1959 Crusade had actually applied to and had come into Moore College and that the large increase at that particular time was due, humanly speaking, to Billy Graham's preaching mm. and ministry. Mm. It was wonderfully encouraging. Mm. 
uh, he was an in, a wonderfully humble man. He spoke about uh, uh, the Bible, the Word of God, and he carried a Bible in his hands to indicate that the authority was not his own, but from the Bible itself. And uh, he encouraged people. He spoke of free forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I re recall one occasion where a man was going off to, uh, uh, to perform a robbery in the area. And he heard that Billy Graham was on that particular day. He had all his, his tools with him. He went, uh, decided that he had an out of spare before he got out to the eastern suburbs where he was going to uh, rob a particular house. Went and heard the crusade, uh, Billy Graham preaching, and was converted. And then, after the the uh, session was over, produced his his uh, bag, tools. Of tools. <laughs> bag of tools to show what he'd been aiming to do, but has now changed. And these kind of stories would turn up in the paper. And sometimes Billy Graham would tell of experiences that he'd met someone who'd come and told him what had happened to them the night before. Yeah. So people were very interested. And Billy Graham, um, as Peter said, was a very humble man. Yeah. But he was fated a bit. And, and I think he didn't like it very much. Yeah. He liked to be seen as someone. He was of his own background. He said he was a farm boy. Yeah. And that's how he always saw himself as, as just another sinner. That's yeah. what he used to yeah. say often. Yeah. Um, and the way he used to hold his Bible and refer to his Bible was so impacting. Mm. It wasn't all about him at all. Mm. It was mm. so obvious. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The reports that came through in his relationships with uh, significant people on a one-to-one -one basis, Billy Graham was always courteous, deferential, thoughtful for the person that he was dealing with, but at the same time was prepared if the person... Uh, uh, wasn't able to, how shall I put it, um, wasn't able, didn't wish to change, let's put it that way. Um, and then he would simply gently but firmly say what God's word had mm. spoken. Mm. And so you had this mix of great courtesy, thoughtfulness, sensitivity, and, but at the same time a clear-cut uh, presentation of the gospel. Mm. He was often interviewed by talk shows, radio and TV. And in the 50s, 59, um, TV was a bit of a novelty in Australia. And there were many times that he would be interviewed by, there was a man called Mike Willisy. He'd been, been like maybe Ray Martin of today. And people would watch those and mm. um, talk to each other about what they'd seen. So I think the press, the journalists, were very interested in what Billy Graham was doing. Mm. I, I think as I can only speak in terms of the Diocese of Sydney. It had certainly been strengthened during that time. Mm. Yeah. And there were other uh, members of other denominations as well where yeah. their churches were, were strengthened. I think the ethos in some senses had changed by 1968. 59 was a... Uh, 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 optimal time you might say mm. 68 a bit less so but billy graham was the same the same humble man mm. glorifying the lord jesus christ wanting very much um, folk to come into a relationship with the lord mm. jesus one of the texts that, that uh, stuck in my mind which he used often he that is often reproved but doesn't um, follow up will suddenly be cut off and that without remedy in other words, he was speaking judgment, but but in a way by a man who knew that he himself had been freed from that judgment because mm. of what the Lord Jesus <coughs> had done for, for him. Mm. 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 Uh, for the rest of our time, I just want to think about uh, Billy Graham and the Bible and Billy Graham and the Gospel. Uh, because you can uh, look at someone like Billy Graham and think uh, that he lived a life of kind of untrammeled uh, uh, faith in, in Christ and he just went from strength to strength. But actually, if you read his biography, uh, Just As I Am, which is a, a really uh, encouraging read, uh, he actually recounts a period of 
uh, of doubt, uh, where he struggled in his faith. And uh, he um, describes how he was challenged by a good friend who said this to him, Billy, you're 50 years out of date. People no longer accept the Bible as inspired as you do. Your faith is too simple. Your language is out of date. You're going to have to learn the new jargon if you're going to be successful in your ministry. And challenges like that from his friend, other challenges from science and philosophy rocked Billy Graham. And uh, he says that he had no doubts concerning the deity of Jesus or the validity of the gospel, but uh, was the Bible completely true? That's what he wrestled with. And given his doubts, he faced up to the fact that he might have to give up pulpit evangelism. He felt he couldn't, in good conscience, uh, preach anymore. Uh, What did he do? Well, it's really interesting that firstly, he faced up to his doubts. Um, He understood the significance of what was happening. He took them seriously, and he dealt with them. Uh, Could the Bible be trusted completely? Uh, What was he going to do? Well, this is how he describes his approach. Alone in my room one evening, I read every verse of Scripture I could think of that had to do with, thus says the Lord. I remember hearing someone say that the prophets had used the phrase, the word of the Lord said, or thus says the Lord, more than 2,000 times. I had no doubts concerning the deity of Jesus Christ or the validity of the gospel, but was the Bible completely true? If it was not exactly doubtful, uh, exactly true, I was certainly disturbed. And so I pondered the attitude of Jesus towards the scriptures. He loved these sacred writings and quoted from them constantly. Never once did he intimate that they could be wrong. In fact, he verified some of the stories in the Old Testament that were hardest to believe, such as concerning Noah and Jonah. With the writer of the Psalms, Jesus delighted in the law of the Lord, the Scriptures. So in other words, what did Billy Graham do? Well, in the face of his doubts, he read the Bible. In the face of his doubts about the Bible, he read the Bible. He read, it seems, verse after verse. He thought about Jesus' attitude to the Scriptures and how he held them in the highest authority. Uh, uh, Billy Graham came to the conviction uh, in time that the Bible was entirely trustworthy and that he could continue to preach and teach God's Word. I I think this is wonderfully instructive. Uh, Too often when we have doubts about the Bible, we, we tend to look elsewhere. We, we try to see what science or history might do to help us to believe the Bible. But Billy Graham shows us that fundamentally, doubts about the Bible are resolved by reading the Bible. Go back to the Bible. Read all the times where it says, thus says the Lord. Read how Jesus understood uh, the Bible. Uh, wonderfully encouraging for us to see that even someone like Billy Graham did have a period of doubt. But I think challenging for us in the way that he resolved his doubts was by sinking himself in the scriptures. That's Billy Graham in the Bible. Uh, What about Billy Graham and the gospel of Jesus? If anything else, uh, Billy Graham gave himself to preaching the gospel of Jesus, and he was a wonderfully direct and clear evangelist. Uh, He recounts in his um, biography of meeting uh, President Truman, and uh, they had a nice uh, discussion And uh, he says that uh, their time was running out. But what I really wanted to talk to him about was his faith. And I didn't know where to begin. Mr. President, I blurted out, tell me about your religious background and leanings. Well, he replied in his Missouri accent. I can't do a Missouri accent, so he replied in his Missouri accent, I try to live by the Sermon on the Mount and the Golden Rule. It takes more than that, Mr. President. It's faith in Christ and his death on the cross that you need. Wonderfully direct response to the president, to the leader of the the free world, arguably. Uh, Direct, you need to trust in Christ. You need to trust his death on the cross. And that really, uh, that evangelistic zeal, even speaking so clearly and directly to the president, marked his ministry over so many years. And there are two passages that he returned to, or two verses that he returned to frequently, and they're in John 3, which were read uh, earlier. So uh, if you've closed your Bible, you might want to open up again uh, to John 3. 
And uh, you'll remember in John 3, it's the record of uh, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, uh, who came to Jesus at night. John tells us verse 2, and uh, sort of shows his knowledge to, uh, to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. We, we, you know, I've, I've, I, I, I think you're great. You know, you're a teacher from God. And what does Jesus say to him? Very truly, I tell, to, tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How could someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Uh, what this passage very simply teaching us is uh, there's no such thing as kind of... Uh, partial Christianity or nominal Christianity or half-hearted Christianity. To be a Christian is someone who has been born from above. It, it is someone who God has given new birth to. And, and what does that mean? Well, uh, this language of being born of the water and the spirit, it, the water of, of forgiveness and the spirit, that, that spiritual uh, birth. And this is what Billy Graham uh, says at one point, have you been born again? Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it being saved, but has it happened to you? Does Christ live in your heart? Do you know it? Many people have gone through a long time uh, about religion and Christianity, and yet they've never made a commitment. Are you committed to Jesus Christ? And uh, Billy Graham will point to the, the example of Nicodemus, this religious person, this person who, uh, you know, uh, uh, oozed religion. And yet Jesus had to say to him, you need to be born again. And I think this passage and certainly the way that Billy Graham preached it is a challenge to us to examine our hearts. Have we been born again? Or are we just assuming because we uh, go to church, because we have the trappings of religion, that we are right with God? have we actually put our faith in Christ? Uh, well, the, the passage continues, and uh, we get to John 3, 16, arguably the most famous uh, verse in the Bible. And, uh, but just before John 3, 16, this is what Jesus says, John 3, 14. Uh, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the, uh, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Uh, so uh, you'll remember in, in Numbers, uh, the, uh, the people grumbled. God sent uh, the serpents uh, who bit them. Many were dying. Moses is told to uh, 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 make a bronze serpent and lift it up. And when it's, it was lifted up, someone was bitten. They could just look to the bronze serpent and, and live. Now, but Jesus is so much greater. As he's lifted up on the cross, we just look to him and we have eternal life. And that's uh, what uh, John says next in the most famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And this is, again, what Billy Graham says. This is the one scripture that I always preach on in a crusade, uh, usually on the opening night. I suppose it is the most familiar passage in the Bible. It has only 25 words in the English translation of it, but it's the gospel in a nutshell. Someone has called it a miniature Bible. Uh, the word whoever in this verse means the whole world. Uh, whatever the color of a person's skin, whatever language he speaks, God loves him and God is willing to save him. To me, that is marvelous. It also says that life doesn't begin when you die. It begins here and now because we can have eternal life now and we can know God in the present. Uh, what I want to do to finish is um, we're just going to play a, a couple of clips from Billy Graham's uh, preaching where he draws on these passages. You must be born again, and God so loved uh, the world. And I want you, as you uh, watch these clips, not just to sort of watch them uh, out of kind of historical interest. You'll see the preaching is uh, quite a different style than the way that people preach today. But I want you to uh, really listen as Billy Graham opens up the scriptures and challenges us uh, do we actually have a personal relationship uh, with God? Have we put our faith in Christ? 
Or are we just thinking of ourselves, because we are vaguely religious, we like going to church, uh, that that makes us right with God? Now, the challenge as we hear uh, him uh, preaching on these uh, passages is the challenge that Jesus gave uh, to Nicodemus, uh, that to enter God's kingdom, we need to be born again. And as we look at the um, uh, dawn in that passage, that comes through putting our faith in Christ. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, watch uh, the clips. I- I'm going to pray now, and then uh, you'll, you'll see the clips, and then um, that'll be it. Let me pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you for the life of Billy Graham. Uh, we thank you for his relentless uh, and faithful preaching of the gospel. And uh, we pray for all of us as we've uh, thought a little bit about John 3 and Jesus challenge to Nicodemus uh, that we might examine our hearts and uh, consider if we have been uh, born again, if our faith is in Christ, if we've known forgiveness, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God weighs the heart. He weighs it by the Ten Commandments. He weighs it by the Sermon on the Mount. He weighs it by the great law. He weighs it by Christ. And the Bible says that all have come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says there's not a person that doeth good, no, not one. There is not a person here that weighs enough. And I will give you a heart of flesh. That's the reason Christ said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. I ask you tonight, wouldn't you like to have a new heart? Wouldn't you like to have new power and new strength and a new dynamic to your life? Wouldn't you like to have a new moral nature that would give you strength and power to face temptation and the tempter? Wouldn't you like to have Christ tonight who can forgive the past? He transforms you and you become a new creation in Christ. Is your heart right? Is your heart right? Is your heart right? Would you like to have a new heart? I tell you tonight you can You say, well, Billy, how long does it take? That quick. The Holy Spirit is the one that performs the operation of regeneration. And in a flash, if you are willing to renounce and confess and acknowledge that you've sinned against God, you're willing to accept God's diagnosis of your heart. You're willing to accept the fact that your heart is sinful, that it's deceitful, that you've sinned against Him, You're willing to acknowledge it and you're willing to renounce and turn from your sin. And you're willing to come to Christ who died on the cross and rose again. Then he will give you a new heart and you will go back to your shop, back to your office, back to your home, back to your responsibilities to live a new life. The gospel is vertical. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, a right heart, but it's also horizontal. Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. And when your heart is right, you have the ability, the capacity to love your neighbor properly. But not till then. Give your life to Christ tonight. Let him give you a new heart. Make you a new person. And give you the joy and the peace that you've always longed for. Now, it'll cost you something. It doesn't come cheap. It cost Christ his blood. It cost God his son. And it'll cost you your sins. He demands that you deny self. Take up the cross. Take his unpopularity. Take your place with him in suffering if need be. But in return, he'll give you a new heart. He'll accept you into his kingdom. He'll forgive the past. He'll make you a new creation. There is none other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other way except by the way of that cross. I want to tell you something. If there had been another way of salvation, Jesus would have never died on the cross. On the night that he was betrayed, the night before he died, he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he praying? He was saying, oh God, if it is possible to save Billy Graham, if it is possible to save Bill and Jim and Susie and the human race, if it is possible any other way, if they can work their way to heaven, if they can buy their way to heaven, 
If there's any other way, oh God, spare me the cross tomorrow. But the answer, as it were, came back from heaven. There is no other way. Man cannot be saved by bread alone. Man cannot be saved by earning his way, by working his way. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is only one way that men can get to heaven, one road. Jesus said it was a narrow road. He said the gate was narrow. And it's the cross, and I must come to his cross. That's the reason that one-third of Matthew, one-third of Mark, that's the reason that one-half of John is given over to the death of Jesus Christ in Hayes' life of Lincoln. There are 5,000 pages and Lincoln was dramatically assassinated, but there are only 25 pages given to his death. Yet in the biographies of Jesus Christ, from a third to a half are given to his death. Why? Because it's the only way to heaven. It is the only way to get forgiveness of sin. And if you haven't come by faith to the foot of that cross renouncing your sins, I don't care who you are, what you are, you'll never be in heaven. You might be a member of some church. You might live a good, decent life, and all of that is fine. But your sins are not forgiven, and you're not going to heaven unless you've come by the way of that cross. Have you come by the way of that cross yet? We're about to hear a song now called Just As I Am. This was the song that was playing every night as Billy gave the invitation to come down and to become born again, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour and to accept the forgiveness and mercy that we can find in him. Because it was played every night as that invitation happened in so many places around the world, this became like an anthem for evangelical Christians uh, as it summarised the mercy that we find in Jesus, the hope that we find in him as sinners, and as it defined the moment when so many people uh, came to Christ, their hearts were turned and they found saving grace in him. So if you know this song, feel free to sing along. If not, just listen to the words and think about the truths that it tells us. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidest me come to thee, O Lamb of God. Just as I am for wretched blind, side reaches he, leaning on the mind. Yes, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God.
to have you with us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and strengthened in your faith and maybe today even challenged 
about being born again, about trusting in Jesus for the very first time and having that new life and the certain hope that he alone can give through his death on the cross. If that's you and you'd like to chat to someone or if you'd like to respond in any way, do click on the form on the link in the description of this video or drop us a a note on Facebook or send us an email uh, at allsaintspetersham.org.au. We'd love to be in touch. We'd love to serve you in any way to see you know more about Jesus and grow in your faith in him. But let me finish with these words from the end of the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See you next time.